As you can tell this morning as we sing, the theme is about the shepherd because we're looking at uh, the I am statements of Jesus and we have over the last few weeks uh, heard those words of Jesus as he speaks about who he is and teaches us about his nature and teaches us about uh, about who he is. In the, in the Greek, that is a statement, ego emi, and it's a very extraordinary statement. And as Jesus makes that, John picks up on that uh, seven different times in the book of John where Jesus makes that ego emi statement, I, even I am, I am that I am statement that Jesus makes. And then along with that, he attaches a metaphor to help us understand about his redemptive work. And we have looked at Jesus helping us understand that with the metaphor of I am the uh, bread of uh, bread of life, I am the light of the world, I am the door, I am the resurrection of life. And this morning we pick up in John chapter 10 about Jesus um, expanding really the idea of the door because we talked about Jesus as the door, but the illustration from that is the shepherd who sits in the door, who becomes the door uh, to keep the sheep. And to expand on that, that Jesus tells us this morning, I am the good shepherd. I'm going to start this morning a little different, but I want to read an excerpt from a book uh, that was written by a man whose name is Lynn Anderson. Lynn Anderson is the president of Hope Network, and uh, that is a, uh, a network of, uh, uh, that works with church leadership, of mentoring pastors and church leaders. And uh, he wrote a little book, and uh, uh, the title of the book, Remember, he's dealing with pastors and church leaders, and the name of the, of the book is They Smell Like Sheep. Kind of caught my attention. But this is a little excerpt from the book. He said, years ago, several years ago, uh, I was in the land of Palestine, my wife, Carolyn. Carolyn and I rode a tour bus through Israel's countryside, nearly mesmerized by the tour guide explaining the scenery, the history, and the lifestyle in his description, he included a heartwarming portrayal of the ancient shepherd-sheep relationship. He expanded on how the shepherd builds a relationship with his sheep, how he feeds them and, and, uh, and gently cares for them. He pointed out that the shepherd doesn't drive the sheep, but the shepherd leads the sheep, and that the shepherd does not uh, very rarely needs to be harsh with the sheep um, because they hear his voice and usually they follow him. He then explained how on a previous tour, things had backfired for him as he was giving the same speech about sheep and shepherds. In the midst of spinning this pastoral tale, he suddenly realized that he had lost his audience. They were all staring out the bus window at a guy chasing a herd of sheep. He was throwing rocks at the sheep. He was whacking them with sticks. He was sicking the sheepdog on them. The sheep-driving man in the field had torpedoed the guide's enchanting narrative. The guide told us that he had become so agitated that he jumped off the bus and ran into the field and accosted the man and said, Do you understand what you have just done to me? He said, I was spinning a charming story about a gentle way of a shepherd, and here you are mistreating and hazing and assaulting these sheep. What's going on? For a moment, a bewildered look froze on the man's face of the poor sheep chaser. And then a light dawned, and he blurted out, Man, you've got me wrong. I'm not a shepherd. I'm a butcher. This poor unwitting fellow had just provided the tour guide and all of us with a perfect example of what a good shepherd is not. This morning, we're going to see the good shepherd. And so if you'll look there in John chapter 10, and for us to understand the nature of the shepherd, this morning we're going to spend a lot of time because to understand the nature of the shepherd, you also have to understand the nature of the sheep. And so we're going to look at that this morning. Let's hear the words of Jesus in John chapter 10 and beginning in verse 10. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is hired, who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. 
even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep. Aren't you glad that word's in there? I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and will answer, they will answer my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I receive from my Father. This morning as we start thinking about the good shepherd, and we're going to think about the nature of the sheep and the nature of the shepherd, but for us to be uh, true to an expository um, understanding of the words of the Scripture, we have to start off with what Jesus says and how that translates into our culture. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And in that day and time, it meant something completely different than it means in our culture. If you hear somebody say, I am the good shepherd, and, and do you have a little problem with that? Because this is Jesus speaking. When Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, because to us, good is a degree that's maybe just above mediocre. I mean, it's not bad, and it's good, but it's just barely above average is what we would say. Saw a commercial yesterday, and I thought, uh, this has nothing to do with the Bible. And it's not about a shepherd, but it is about how we think about the word good. And so I'm not trying to sell you a GM truck this morning, but watch this commercial. And more importantly, listen uh, to the comparison from our culture, like a pro. All those descriptions of good, that's kind of how our, our culture feels about good. But in that day and time and in this word, whenever it says, I am the, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, it means that he is... The only one. It means he stands apart. He is completely different. He is not just a shepherd, but he's the good shepherd. There's nothing higher. There's nothing better. There's nothing more. He is the one of all the description that is given above good. In that culture, when, they, when Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, he was saying, I am to a degree by myself. There's none other like me. And so when he says, ego I am, and he identifies his deity, and then he identifies his redemptive work as the good shepherd, he's telling us that he has the authority to be able to be our shepherd like no one else. So don't, don't let our interpretation of good lessen what Jesus is saying here. You're not going to find hope in anyone else. You're not going to find a way that's any better he is the good shepherd, and he is the only one who can be the good shepherd. With that in mind, you understand the nature of the shepherd is to restore the sheep, to deal with the sheep, to love the sheep, to lay down his life for his sheep, and we're going to look at those. But you also have to see the nature of the sheep. Robert Robinson, I don't think he was kin to Ronnie or Robbie or, or Jonas or any of the Robinsons around here. He's from 1800s. He had a pretty good idea of the nature of the sheep. And we sing a song, one of those old hymns from the 1800s that, that are that's still dear to us. Um, and it is, Oh, to grace how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Prone to wonder. If I ever write a book, I think that'll have to be the title of it. Prone to wonder. And that is a description of a sheep going outside the fold. And that is the nature of of a sheep. So this morning, if you want to go back and look at all the examples in the Bible, we could take any character in the Bible and they could write that same book, Prone to Wander. You took at, look at uh, certainly Adam, but you look at, uh, at Abraham. Abraham was prone to wander. Abraham wandered. Jacob wandered. Isaac wandered. Uh, Moses wandered. David wandered. Peter wandered. Dale wandered. And you can put your name there too. 
we are prone to wonder. And I'm thankful this morning that the wonderful good shepherd, our good shepherd, that his nature is such that he takes us in the midst of all of who we are and that he is patient and he is kind and he is attentive and that he brings sheep to himself. He restores his sheep in the midst of all of our stubbornness and our complaining of all the things that we do against our shepherd. I am thankful he is the good shepherd. This morning I'm going to be preaching to, certainly if you're here and you never trusted Christ, he calls you to himself. But also I am declaring to every sheep who wanders this morning how you can get right with God, but how he means for us to stay right with God. And there is a difference between a relationship with God and fellowship with God. My relationship is secure. I never have to wonder about my relationship. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He is always the good shepherd, but I'm not always in right fellowship with him. I wander away from him. And so this morning I'm thankful that I can say to every one of us what David spoke in Psalm 51. David talked about re restoring to me the joy of my salvation. He wasn't worried about his salvation in relationship, but he had wandered from God and he wanted that joy to be restored, to be in right fellowship with God. Every morning, well, in the evening in most of the villages in that part of the world, whenever they would bring the sheep out of the pasture and they would come into their little village, they would normally have a sheepfold. It was an enclosed area. It may have just been a, the, a cave. It may have been a walled up area or something like that that they built. And we talked about last week that the shepherd would sit in the doorway of that. He would be the door of that. But many times there would be many flocks, a lot of shepherds that would bring their sheep in and they would all go into the sheepfold. And so at, in the night they would be in there and they would intermingle and they would all be together and the shepherds would sit in the doorway or maybe they would take turns sitting in the doorway. But in the morning, whenever they got ready to go back into the pasture, then the, the shepherd would come to the opening and he would call his sheep and his sheep would hear his voice. And all these sheep would be mixed up with all the other sheep, and yet the flock of that shepherd would recognize his voice and know his voice, and they would come and they would follow him as he would lead them out. It was, I'm sure, an amazing sight to see all those sheep and those heads come up. It's kind of like whenever mamas know this and daddies know this, you can go into a classroom and there's all these children and everybody's heads will pop up and look, except your second grader. And they'll see you walk in, and what do they do? Well, maybe second grade may not, but by fourth grade, this is what they do. When they see mom or daddy walk in, their head goes down. They're acting like they're busy, aren't they? I want you to think, Mama, I've been doing this all day long, this right here. Whenever you call your child, somebody may say, what a handsome little boy. Somebody may say, my goodness, what a healthy little boy. But whenever you say, that's my little boy, that is a relationship. This morning, I want you to hear not my voice, but the good shepherd stands and he speaks to your heart. Now, the question is this morning, do you hear him? He's calling you. You're in the sheepfold. Do you hear him? And how will you respond? This morning, I want us to think about three different kinds of sheep and three different tools that the shepherd will use. There are three different kinds of sheep. And as a matter of fact, there are three different ways that sheep act, maybe. that Maybe that's better. Because a sheep, a single sheep, each sheep, will act one of these three ways at different times in their life. The amazing thing with the shepherd is that he had to understand how to relate to those sheep all those sheep, the different kind, but to each sheep in, in what their situation was. So the first one is a stubborn sheep. This is a sheep that just willfully acts in disobedience to the shepherd. This is the sheep that just willfully means to get out of line, that is non-responsive to the call of the shepherd. This is the sheep that has developed an attitude. And usually it's a young sheep 
that uh, hasn't learned the ropes yet and wants to step out on his own, but sheep aren't made to do that. And so there is the stubborn sheep. This is the sheep who willfully acts in disobedience and who is stubborn and is selfish. And in this natural state, that's how we are, that we live. And what it does is it puts us in a predicament because it is a self-defeating strategy for living our lives. When I first came here, I preached a series of messages over self-defeating strategies of life. And for the natural man, there are three attitudes that naturally come to us. And it makes sense to us. And it's the three attitudes that I want what I want, very selfish, and I feel like I deserve to get what I want. That's within the heart of every one of us. I deserve to get what I want. And then the third one is that I will hurt whomever I have to, even God. I'll hurt whomever I have to to get what I want. And that is a stubborn sheep. And stubborn sheep act, my mother wouldn't be pleased with me using this word, but stupidly. But I don't know of a better word to describe it. Knowing that they're going to destroy themselves. Sheep can't see very well. So they stumble around, and whenever they get ahead of the shepherd or they wander off from the shepherd and they stray away from the shepherd intentionally, then they're leading themselves into destruction. And that's what happens to us when we are that stubborn sheep. So there's the stubborn sheep. And then there is the straying sheep. This is not a willful act of disobedience. This is just a sheep who is, who is not intentional on following and not paying attention to follow the shepherd. And they've been with this shepherd for a long time. They know the ropes. They know the routine. They know where to go. And they just sort of go through life and kind of move through life. And the next thing they know, they're not being intentional about their relationship and fellowship with the shepherd. And so they begin to stray off. Isaiah 53 tells us that we all of us are like sheep that have gone astray. All of us are that way. So there is the stubborn sheep and the straying sheep, and then there's the sickly sheep that has taken enough hard knocks in the trail and out in the pasture, has uh, nearly been devoured by the wolves and barely escaped, and is just tired and sickly. So there's three kinds of sheep. And then there are three instruments that the shepherd will use to minister to the sheep is the rod, the staff, and oil. Now, you've heard those three instruments uh, in the passage that the choir just sang about, the, the passage of the 23rd Psalm. 23rd Psalm says, uh, verses 4 and 5, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You've anointed my head with oil. Those are three things that the shepherd would use to minister to the sheep. So let us look this morning as the flock. Do you hear the shepherd's voice? And if you do, then understand how he deals with three kinds of sheep, but how he deals with each one of us at different stages of our life. When we are the stubborn sheep, then the shepherd restores the stubborn sheep with a rod. Now, normally we think of the staff. I'm talking about the rod right now. The rod was generally a shorter, heavier, what we would call a club. It would be sometimes a, uh, a sapling that ha maybe had a knot in it, uh, a, a heavier end to it, and you'd think of it as a bat or a club. And as uh, he would use that, that was an instrument he would use for the uh, protection of himself and the sheep. If a wolf came or some predator came, then that would be a weapon that he would use to fight off the wolf as he came. That club would be a, a, a weapon to use to, to protect the sheep. But also it would be an uh, instrument used to correct the sheep. If, if a sheep, as I said, they don't, they don't see very well, so if they got out of line and they were kind of wandering ahead of him and they kept doing that, then he would take that club and he would smack the ground in front of them. 
maybe a root or a rock in front of them and startle the sheep so that they would get back in line and that they would follow him in safety. Does that happen sometimes to you? There's sometimes that you're just maybe even sitting in church and God just smacks a root in front of you or a rock in front of you and says, hey, wake up. Because some of y'all need to wake up. Some of y'all that didn't even phase. I'm so sorry for that. Sometimes God does that. Or he uses a circumstance in life. Or he uses somebody else's words. Or we see something happen and it is just a reminder to us how blessed we are, the goodness of God leads men to repentance, or maybe God just moves us in such a way that it is a wake-up call to us. He would use that rod to go through and beat the bushes to scare off the snakes because, you know what, we'll step right on the snake and never see it until we've been bitten. And that's what the shepherd does to protect the sheep, to correct the sheep. But in the rare case, and usually it was with a young sheep, young lamb, that just had a rebellious spirit and just wouldn't listen to the shepherd, would just wander off, and as he would try to correct it, in the extreme case, then the shepherd would take that rod and he would literally break the leg of that sheep, not to be cruel to the sheep. He would break the leg and then he would set it and he would bind it and he would wrap it And then from that point on, he would carry that sheep. He would bear the burden for that sheep until that sheep completely healed. But in that process of healing, then that sheep learned to depend upon the shepherd. And there are times I want you to know that God, and listen to me, the God who breaks us is always the God who binds us up. Let me just turn to the scripture. Hosea chapter 6 and verse 1. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us, but he will heal us. He has wounded us, but he will bandage us. The God who breaks us is the God who binds us. And he never does it to be cruel. He does it because he loves us and he does it to protect us. He does it to teach us to depend upon him. Psalm 119 and verse 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Psalm 119 verse 71. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. A unique passage in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, the great hall of fame of faith. In verse 26 it says about Jacob, by faith, Jacob, As he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, in a particular little phrase there, and worshiped leaning on the top of his staff. Now you might just think, well, that's because he's old and he needs something to lean on. That's not what it's trying to convey here. This refers back to the story that's told over in Genesis chapter 32. Jacob, you remember the story of Jacob? He stole his his brother's birthright, Esau, And he had to run off, and and he is a scoundrel. He is a schemer all of his life. And finally, God does enough work on him, and, and through the circumstances of life, he finally breaks him, and he changes him. Now, in chapter 32, he is about to meet back up with his brother Esau, and he is wrestling with the Lord. Many believe that it's a pre-incarnate visit of Christ, that that it is a time where he is in the presence of God. And it's uh, the day's coming up, and and he won't let go. And uh, he says, you have to let go. And he said, I'll not let go unless you, you bless me. And he touched his hip. And it says even that from that time, the Jews remembered that God touched him. And they wouldn't even eat that part of an animal, the sinew from around the hip, because it was to remember what God did to Jacob. But from that day forward, Jacob walked differently. At that time as well, God changed his name from Jacob to Israel. And he says, because I have, I have seen the face of God and I have wrestled what Jacob said. And, uh, and from that day forward, he was changed. He was different. His name was different. He walked different. When people saw him coming, they'd say, they could recognize how he walked. And they'd say, who is that? Oh, that's Jacob. They could tell by how he walked. Is that not what we want? 
Is that not what our Christian life ought to be? For us to take that example, well, sometimes for us to learn how to walk in that way, it is only learned through brokenness. It is only learned whenever God touches us in a way that we walk different from that point on. It's not something we enjoy, but God does it for a reason, not not to be cruel, but the God who breaks us is the God who binds us. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5, it says, And have you forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when we are approved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom the Lord does not, whom the Father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all are partakers, then you're illegitimate children, not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us. Can I get an amen? You didn't. <laughs> I did. And we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time that seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. A shepherd restores his sheep with a rod. And sometimes that correction doesn't feel good, but we recognize it changes us. And it brings us into line with the holiness of God and submission before God, and it is the best. That we are destroying ourselves, and God brings discipline into our life, and God restores us into right fellowship with him. Are you here today? Have you been a stubborn sheep? Is God whacking the, the rock in front of you? Is he taking the rod and, and beating the bush and scaring off the snake? Is God running the, uh, the predator away from you? Is he, is he protecting you? What is God doing in your life today? You hear his voice. He's calling. What is he doing? What's he calling you to? He's calling you to follow him. The shepherd restores a stubborn sheep with a rod. Second of all, a shepherd restores a straying sheep with a staff. A staff is what we normally think about with a shepherd. It, it's a longer stick, and they would usually take a green sapling, and they would soak it in water, and then they would begin to shape it and mold it, and usually they would form a crook. And that way, as a shepherd was leading the sheep, he could take, if, if a, they, they can't see very well, so if they were getting to a... Um, maybe a rocky ledge or something that was dangerous, he would take that staff and he would guide them behind him and he would, he would lead them in that way. And that staff was just a gentle reminder to them to follow him and it, he would guide them away from danger. Or if they were trapped, he could, he could take that and hook them and bring them back into safety. Or, or as he was going along, as he would tap that along the ground, that they learned that sound, they learned his walk, they learned his stride, they heard his voice, and that was a comfort to them. And maybe here today, maybe you're thinking about, maybe you're tempted to do something, maybe you feel yourself, and, and you have it's not a willful act, you just haven't been intentional about following the shepherd. And maybe today God has just sort of taken the staff, and he's just sort of gently reminding you today, hey, you got to be intentional about this. This has got to be what you're all about. This has to affect every area of your life. There's not anything that's left untouched. The shepherd restores a straying sheep with a staff. And then the third thing is that the shepherd would restore sickly sheep with oil. We know in that day and time they would use oil for a lot of different things, and a lot of times it would be for medicinal purposes. And so... As a shepherd is guiding the sheep and they're out in the pasture during the day, he may notice a scrape or a sore. And so at night, whenever they would go into the sheepfold and he's sitting in the doorway, then 
he would use that time intentionally. He would use that staff and go and guide that sheep and bring it to the door, and then he would put some oil on those scrapes and those cuts and those bruises to help promote healing and to, to ward off infection. So he would put oil on them. Another thing he would do for all the sheep is that he would make a mixture of oil and sulfur and tar and uh, he would put that on their nose as a repellent to nose flies. I know that's gross, but nose flies would come and just irritate them and lay eggs in their nose. So he would put that oil on their nose as a repellent uh, to the nose flies. So he, he would minister to them. And some that you have been beaten up just from the path of life. You know what? People say, why? Why? Do I go through all this? Why am I enduring this? Why do I have this? And why do I have that? Why have I gone through this? Why have I endured through that? And my answer to that is because you're alive. It's life. Life is hard. Adam and Eve made a choice for sin, and along with that came all sorts of things. It makes life difficult. All creation has been touched by that. And sometimes it seems like we are walking through, and he's, Morton Salt named it right, didn't they? When it rains, it pours. It seems like whenever something happens, it just another thing happens, and then another thing happens, and then another thing happens. And we go through those seasons of our life when we are scraped and bruised and cut up, that the things of this world have just irritated us so. And where do you go? You come to the shepherd, and he puts oil, and he soothes, and he tells you of the promise that he gives, that even when we walk through the darkest valley, that he's there. That's why I'm not afraid, because thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And some of you may say, Pastor, it's been too long. I've gone too far. I just don't think God's looking for me. Well, I'm here to tell you, you're wrong. Because he says he is. Matthew chapter 18, listen to what Jesus says. He said, what do you think? If any man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountain and go and search for the one that is straying? If it turns out that he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 which have gone astray. He is looking. He is calling. There's a question, will you hear him? Will you surrender to him? Will you let him find you? You say, well, preacher, I just don't know. I don't know if God is able. Well, I'm here to tell you he is. Don't take my word. Take the very act of Jesus. Because what he says in John chapter 10 is the authority of how I know that the shepherd comes for you and that he can restore you. Because in John chapter 10, verse 14, he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Even as my Father knows me, I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus proved that he's looking for you. He stands at the gate. He calls you. He's got every tool that he needs to use to restore you. And he will rejoice when you come to him. And I've got the proof that he is able to do it because he laid down his life for you. And I've got even better news. He also said, I have the authority to lay it down and I have the authority to take it up again. That's what we're celebrating today. This is Easter all over again for us. This is the Easter of this week. It's the first day of the week, and we worship on the first day of the week to celebrate that Jesus got up out of the grave. 
and he's calling you. Will you hear your voice?